Just want to thank everybody for joining us today. I'm Brian Estes. I'm the CEO and CIO of Off the Chain Capital. Hey, everybody. My name is Robert Breedlove, and I'm excited to be here today to talk about money. Yeah. So if you guys want to go ahead and pull up the first slide. So Robert has a podcast called What is Money? And that's what the first slide here is. So, like, it's a great question. <laughs> My favorite question. question. Right? Yeah, so, but, you know, I just give a little, what are your thoughts? Like, you know, what are the, you know, what is money? Yeah, we were just talking backstage, actually, about what it's like to run into a gold bug. And gold bugs are like Bitcoiners before Bitcoin, you know? They understand that money, the need to have money independent of the state is very important for individual freedom, individual rights, liberties, et cetera. But they get very attached to the, the tangible instantiation of money, right? thinking that gold is the final solution to this social construct we call money. And I think Bitcoiners just see one level deeper. Right? We ask the questions, um, what made gold good money, which gets you into the properties of money. And that's a, a path I've tried to explore on the show a lot is comparing the properties of gold versus the properties of Bitcoin. Because that's, that's instrumental to the thesis of why Bitcoin outcompetes gold over time. So there's no brief answer to the question, what is money? But I think you do eventually get to this realization that it is whatever we make it to be, which sounds very subjective, but there are objective constraints to what good money is, and those are the properties of money. Um, and in, in my strong opinion, Bitcoin is basically the most superior monetary technology we've ever had. Yeah, for um, you know, 10,000 years, we have used commodity-based money as, as our monetary system. And back in 1971, President Nixon severed the tie between gold and the U.S. dollar. And for the last 52 years, we've been running an experiment on fiat money. And you know, we could all see it failing today. And you know, as, I, I think as the world starts to understand that this experiment we've been going through is failing, that we'll opt into a commodity-based money system again, and I don't think we're going back to gold. I think we're going to Bitcoin. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, the Federal Reserve talks about you know money has certain characteristics. It needs to be portable, durable, you know limits limited supply. And, um, divi sorry, divisible. I knew I forgot one. Divisible. And um, you know if you look at our money today. Um, you know, it, it meets three of those. If you look at the U.S. dollar, the one it doesn't meet anymore is limited supply. Um, over the last three years since COVID, the U.S. money supply is up 40%. And we talk about how, you know, prices are going up. You know, it, it's the prices aren't really going up. It just takes more dollars to buy the same freaking thing. You know, so, you know, people are saying inflation is, you know, increased prices. The, the increased price is the result of the debasement of the monetary system. And so um, if we look at these four characteristics, you know, Bitcoin has all these. Robert, do you want to talk about some of these? Um, yeah. And how Bitcoin fits in? Yeah. So this is why gold doesn't win, by the way, or it doesn't work. Um, we needed, because gold is this heavy, physical, bulky metal, right? It's expensive to secure, expensive to transport. Um, it's not very good for moving value or expressing value across space. It's very expensive to do that. So we overcame this shortcoming of gold. This is like a technical flaw in the monetary technology of gold in that it's limited in terms of its portability. So human beings, uh, being the geniuses that we are, we overcame this property by putting all the gold in one place, right? One vault or one warehouse, and we issued paper on top of it. And so that was a, it's like a technological overlay to improve its portability and make it more useful as money. The problem, of course, is that we've now centralized all of that gold into one place. And the warehouses and custodians and banks that house that gold have always kind of reneged on their promise, which is you can bring the, the warehouse receipt back to the warehouse at any time and I'll, I'll redeem the gold for you. So it's, gold lacks portability which leads to its centralization, which culminates in central banking. So the paradigm that we're living under today is a direct consequence of the technological failings or shortcomings of gold. And this is something that Bitcoin simply does not suffer, right? Bitcoin 
perfects, in addition to perfecting all the other monetary properties, it also perfects portability in the sense that it's just pure information and you can transmit it at the speed of light. So there's quite, quite literally no faster way to move Bitcoin. Um, and in a Bitcoinized world, all the institutional realities built on top of it would look fundamentally different because we don't have a need to centralize it. It's trivial for me to self-custody my own Bitcoin or I can use a, engage in a collaborative custody model with a number of custodians to minimize my counterparty risk. So this, I mean, it's, it's hard to put it in just a few words, but I think this is why Bitcoin is so transformational to the entirety of our socioeconomic reality today. Yeah, in addition to being more portable, it's more divisible. You know, it's hard to divide gold, and you, know, you can't go take a bar of gold into Starbucks and shave a, you know, a few shavings off to pay for your Starbucks. Um, you know, it's, you know, so it's more portable, more divisible, it's more verifiable than gold. You know, it's easy to verify Bitcoin, it's hard to verify gold. Um, JP Morgan just learned that with nickel. So I don't know if you saw that, you know, where they went and uh, pull up, you know, some blocks of nickel out of their vault and it was lead or something. It, wa it wasn't nickel. So, um, you know, you know, Bitcoin's easy to verify, gold's not. And, it, you know, a lot of people talk about the ESG concerns about Bitcoin, but if you compare Bitcoin to mining gold, you know, Bitcoin's a lot cleaner than, than mining gold. So you want to go into the next slide and we'll talk about, you know, how money developed over the last 3,000 years. So if we look at the um, way humans developed, about 10,000 years ago, we lived in tribes of 100 to 150 people. And whatever the local scarce commodity was in that area, that's what we defaulted to as our money. So for some communities, um, like I live in Orlando, so there's not a lot of shells in Orlando. So we use probably stones. The Indians probably use stones there. But in Miami, there's a lot of shells, so you're not going to use shells as money because they're not scarce. So they may use you know, something else in Miami, the Indians here. And so whatever that scarce commodity was, we, we defaulted into that. And then um, the problem is that when the, you know, the tribes would come together and try to do commerce, if one was using stones and the other one's using shells, it was just too much friction and it was hard to do commerce. So we as humans, we defaulted into a gold and silver system 3,500 years ago. And, and that's what we've been using for, you know, like I said, over 3,000 years. And then in the 11th century, the Chinese invent, invented paper money. So people would deposit their gold at a depository, have paper money issued out on that, and they used that on the Silk Road. They used that for commerce on the Silk Road. And you know that lasted for a long time. And then about 500 years ago, Leonardo da Vinci invented double entry bookkeeping, which is ledger technology. And the Medici family over in Italy started building banks based off this technology. And really that's all Bitcoin is. It's ledger technology we've been using for 500, 500 years. The only difference is that it's, I would call it triple entry bookkeeping instead of double entry bookkeeping because the ledger is open and it's distributed around the world and updated every 10 minutes. And, and that's all Bitcoin is. It's that ledger technology we've been using for forever. It's just, it, it's just a better form of it. Yeah, it's a great point. These very simple technologies like ledgers or double entry bookkeeping, they really impact how the world works. Um, it's hard to understate how just a simple thing, right? Having debits and credits really changed the world of commerce, accounting, finance, capital allocation, mobilization, risk sharing, like everything that we take for granted today, stock markets, et cetera, it's built on this, this double entry paradigm. And Bitcoin just makes the double entry paradigm more secure by adding the third, uh, the third entry of basically the timestamp, right? It's verifying and saying this, these transactions were completed uh, every 10 minutes. Uh, we talked about different monies being used over time, and just one point I would like to make is that, and this is the monetary property I typically refer to as scarcity, but one of the things, the most important thing money really does is that it mediates the exchange of goods and services, right? This is something that we can trade our good, goods and services for and then that we can then take back into the marketplace to trade for goods and services from other people. The thing about um, goods and services is that they all require work 
to produce. There's no such thing as a, a good or service that someone does not help generate or create or sell. And so if you have a money that can be produced without work, that is then u- usable to acquire goods and services that require work, I think this highlights the problem with, with fiat money. Like you have to have proof of work in the money. Otherwise, whoever can produce the money without any work has a direct and strong incentive to do so, to use it to steal, which it is stealing effectively, uh, goods and services from those who are using the money. And this has been kind of the, the battle royale, I guess, of monies across time. It's like people trying to figure out where's the best place to store my purchasing power that other people will not debase or counterfeit. And that entire process culminated in gold. Right? Gold was the most difficult commodity to produce, essentially impossible to counterfe- counterfeit uh, or inflate the supply. And so therefore, it was a good representation of the work necessary for the goods and services to which it could acquire in the marketplace. You talk about inflating away. I mean, if you think about it, you know, God gives us a limited amount of time here on earth. Um, they give us, God, you know, he gives us God-given abilities, you know, to have a skill. And, you know, and we take the energy that we get from the plants and the, you know, the animals from the earth to create energy for ourselves. And we combine those to make value. We take our time and our effort and our skill and, and the energy to create value for ourselves and for others. And once we create this value, you know, how do you store it for the future? I mean, that, that's the big question. If you store it in dollars and the Fed says, the, you know, they want to, you, know, def- you know, inflate the money by 2% a year, they're basically telling you over 50 years they're going to take all your money, you know, that, that you've saved today. So keeping it in dollars doesn't work. And we need to find, a, you know, a better solution than keeping our money in dollars. And, you know, we've, I, I've come to the conclusion that, you know, Bitcoin's the best store of value that humans have ever created. Because it, it can't be diluted. You know, there's a maximum of 21 million Bitcoin that could ever be created, and it will never be more than that. And so, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I think that, you know, you know, Bitcoin is it, and, you know, that's why I'm so passionate about it. Yes, yeah, the only fixed supply asset human beings have ever created and probably will ever create. So if you want to own, it's the only money you can own a guaranteed fraction of the total money supply. So to your point, it's like a, it's a perfect store of value and that it perfectly represents your share of everything that money can buy. So in, in theory, as the world progresses and we produce more goods and services, we get smarter uh, at making these things. So things uh, we can deliver goods and services better, faster, cheaper. The purchasing power of a perfect store of value like Bitcoin should increase in tandem. It's good that you said, you know, you, when you own Bitcoin, you own a fraction of the total reserve. Um, but Satoshi was kind of funny, too. He, I, one of his comments, he said that, you know, as people mismanage their Bitcoin and lose their private keys, it's a donation to everybody else. So it, your, your percentage actually goes up over time as people mismanage their Bitcoin. So you want to go on to the next slide? So this is just a, another you know, representation of what we talked about. You know, um, you know, we as humans use you know commodity-based money and gold and silver for 3,500 3, years, and then ledger technology and, and this little fiat system that we've been on for 52 years. It's a very, very small portion of the total timeline of our money system um, that we as humans have used. And like I said a while ago, is you know, I, you know, when we went off the gold standard in 1971, you know, we we stopped the convertibility of you know of dollars back into gold. And, you know, this experiment that we've been running, it's, it's out of control. You know, the government prints more and more money with no work behind it. And, you know, like um, Jay Powell was on 60 Minutes a year ago, and he said we just add zeros to the ledger, you know. And it's just, that's not right. It's theft. You know, it's immoral. And, you know, in my opinion, it's against God wills to, to steal your time and your energy from you. Yeah, it's easy for us, uh, I guess, looking out from behind our own eyes to forget that fiat currency is not the norm of human history, right? Although we have grown up with it and been around it for most of our lives, most of us, um, when you look at the broader time horizon, it's anything but normal. And 
when you look at the history of individual fiat currencies, I think you said the first experiment was in China in 11th century, maybe earlier. They all end the same, essentially. The, the, the monetary authority that arrogates itself the privilege to print the money, surprise, surprise, you know, no work required. They have that big incentive to do so. They print so much of it that it becomes worthless, right? This is hyperinflation. And the only other real demise of fiat currencies is if that country gets conquered and then they end up monetizing to another fiat standard. Um, so easy for us to forget that the monetary standard today is not normal. It's also easy to forget or maybe not even be aware that it is stealing from us, right? We've been conditioned through Keynesian propaganda and university curriculum that inflation is a normal and healthy part of an economic system. It's anything but. Why would you want someone to counterfeit the money that you're holding your savings in? That just means they're diluting your savings over time. There's no equitable economic benefit whatsoever. And so maybe this contributes to the difficulty of trying to understand Bitcoin is that you can't just look at the world through the context of your own life. You have to zoom out, as we say often in Bitcoin, and look at the bigger picture. And in, in that bigger picture, I think Bitcoin represents a return to commodity money or hard money as, uh, as a standard, which humans have organized themselves around uh, for centuries. Okay, you want to go on the next slide? So this is just another summary of um, how we got on the fiat standard. So we had Bretton Woods Agreement after World War II. And then, um, you know, it's just like, like I said, you know, Nixon severed that tie back in 1971. Um, but you want to go to the next slide? Um, and you can see here, like, the fiat systems aren't working. You know, the, you know, the goal is to have 2% inflation. Well, I think, you know, over 80% of the nations have more than 2% inflation. And, you know, even in the United States, um, you know, the CPI number came out just a few days ago, and it was down to 5%. Yeah, they're celebrating 5% inflation. And that's, uh, in my opinion, that's probably a rigged number. It's probably much more than 5%. Go on to the next slide. Um, so I, I teach over at, um, I'm a guest lecturer at Cambridge University, and I, um, last time I went over there, I wanted to study the history of the British pound. So I went back to figure out like when the British pound started and what, you know, what it was. And it makes sense, a pound, right? It's, so the British pound started in 757. It was actually one pound of pure silver that was divisible into 240 shillings. And then over time, you know, kings would you know, dilute this, you know, the coin and add tin to it or shave off the edges. And, you know, about, you know, 700 years later, you know, it was, there was only eight ounces of silver in a pound. And if you look at what's in a pound today, you know, to buy a pound of silver, to buy 16 ounces of silver, you know, it costs over 300 pounds to do that. So if you take one divided by, you know, three, over 300, you know, it comes up to like 0 .003. You know, there's 0 .003 ounces of silver in a pound today. And so you could see this over, you know, over a, you know, 1,400-year time period, you know, the, you know the, even the British pound got diluted away. Um, and, you know, if you think about when the British pound went from 16 ounces of silver to 8 ounces of silver over 600 years, you know, and the average life expectancy was 35 years, you know, people aren't trying to notice that kind of inflation, you know, you know, half, losing half your money over, you know, six or 700 years. But when we lose 40% of our money or purchasing power over three years, we notice that. We're all noticing it. And so, you know, I, I just thought it'd be interesting, like you said, zoom out, and this is a great way to zoom out. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And the, the names of these currencies, right, the pound, the lira, the dollar, many others, they all use terms that refer to weight. And that, that's, on, that's by design, right? It was, it was the currency was redeemable for a certain weight of precious metal. And I, I just think, Maybe that's an important thing to keep in mind, right? That um, these things don't function, actually, unless they are tethered to some commodity metal. There's a, there has to be some weight that it is redeemable for. Otherwise, you're just carrying around this uncollateralized debt obligation in your pocket. And it works as long as the confidence game is maintained, but there's no fundamental economic anchoring at all. It's just a confidence game. And so the fact, I'm honestly amazed that 
the U.S. dollar fiat standard has persisted this long. Uh, a lot of it has to do with, I think, the productivity gains we've enjoyed going in, into the digital age. That that actually creates more economic surplus for the central bank to harvest through the counterfeiting of currency. Whereas if productivity were not growing so fast, you would feel the pain a lot more, right? As they printed money, prices would skyrocket. Um, there's, there's this pressure, right, between the market trying to pull prices down and then the central bank trying to push prices up to keep the, the debt structure sustainable. And I think it just hides uh, a lot of the pain that would otherwise be inflicted. But, but the names of the currencies tell the truth, right? These were originally exchangeable or redeemable for weights of precious metal. Okay, you wanna go on the next slide? Um, so I call this one the everything bubble. So if we look at what happened back in the early 90s when the internet bubble popped um, in 99, 2000, what the Federal Reserve started doing is they started lowering interest rates to cover up the pain and to jack up um, you know, you know, stock, the stock market and support the bond market. And this has been going on for over 30 years. So if you think about it, our economic output, our GDP, should be equivalent to what our net worth is over time. And it was like that until the early 90s, and you see it started to separate like this. And so what this means is that you know, the, the Federal Reserve has lowered interest rates and manipulated the cost of money to make us richer. And, but it's not necessarily equivalent to our output, our economic output. And so, um, in my opinion, I, I think these eventually have to come back together. Um, and, you know, we may be seeing early signs of that today. Um, and, you know, I, I think over time, you know, th this will come back together, you know, as the system transitions to the new financial system. Yeah, I guess, the, you know, the one important point here is that this curve you're looking at, how it's, it's jumped exponentially in recent years, this is the pattern that most fiat currencies follow. Because every time, on a fiat currency standard, you're actually incentivized to accumulate more debt because the purchasing power of the money is being eroded over time. So you borrow stronger dollars, pay back weaker dollars. So a fiat currency standard impels market actors to take on more and more debt. And when you take on more debt, you're actually creating this, what's called a money multiplier effect in the banking system. So liabilities grow non-linear to the number of dollars printed. And then the next time there's an economic uh, recession or crash, you have all of these unpayable liabilities, like exponentially more, which encourages the central bank to intervene and print exponentially more dollars. So for instance, in 2008, we printed $700 billion. That was a gigantic, unheard of number at the time to bail out the, the banking system. And since March 2020, the start of COVID, I think we initially printed $6 trillion, that's 6,000 billion. And I'm pretty sure there's been an additional 2 trillion authorized since the beginning of the banking crisis. So we're talking about in the past 36 some odd months, roughly $8,000 billion, which is $8 trillion. That's an order of magnitude, more than an order of magnitude, more than the 700 billion that was printed in 2008. So it's this, gradually then suddenly dynamic that really kills fiat currencies over time. And I think we are, I mean, clearly staring down the barrel of a hyperinflationary gun um, with activity over the past few years. Yeah, and I, I just want to point out the morality of this too, because the people that own assets, if you own stocks or real estate, you've benefited from this bubble. But people who work for wages, which are 99% of the people out there, you know, you know, you know, if you earn a wage, wages don't keep up with inflation. And so this chart really benefited the top 1% um, at the detriment of the bottom 99%. And so, and it's because our money doesn't hold its value that this is able to occur. Yeah, so it's the poor people living on fixed income, retirees, pensioners, that's who this system abuses most. And I, I can't think of anything more immoral in a monetary system. Okay, I'm gonna go in the next slide. So, so these are the characteristics of Bitcoin. So, you know, we have the, the first ones, portable, divisible, you know, um, you know, 
um, limited supply, durable. But Bitcoin has other characteristics. Robert, do you want to talk about some of the other characteristics that Bitcoin has? Yeah, so uh, I always break it down to five, which everyone has their own little list. It's a little bit different. I say it's divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, and scarcity. A couple of things that Bitcoin has that's really unique uh, in the recognizability department, which is the ability to authenticate the money to make sure it's not counterfeit. Um, you, if you run your own node and someone sends you Bitcoin, like you're not trusting anyone to determine whether or not your, your Bitcoin is authentic. You are verifying it yourself. The code is authenticating the Bitcoin that you are receiving. Your node can also audit the total global supply of Bitcoin. So to verify that it is less than or equal to 21 million essentially and that whatever portion of Bitcoin you have is that guaranteed fraction of the total money supply. So it's, it offers us this kind of new form of recognizability that we've never had before. Uh, we mentioned scarcity earlier, like it, the ideal money would be in fixed supply, right? Something that is, something that you can't create any more of, just like we can't create any more time for ourselves, right? It's this absolutely scarce thing that money is intended to implementize and gold was an approximation of that. It's the most relatively scarce commodity in the world, so it was the best reflection of time, and that's why gold became money. But Bitcoin actually perfects it. Um, I've heard it put that before Bitcoin, the only two things that were absolutely scarce in this universe were time and energy. And humanity has basically invented a third, which is Bitcoin. Um, the dur and I'll, I'll mention durability, too, because people have a, they struggle with this one. If Bitcoin is just information, how could it be durable? You know, what does that even mean? If someone just forgets it, doesn't it just go away? Or, if, you know, someone turns off the software. But the unique thing about Bitcoin, it's actually sort of comparable to something like the Bible, right? That an individual can go out and try to destroy as many Bibles as they want. But the Bible as a concept, as an idea, it's so enmeshed in human history and in our culture, you know, all over the world that the Bible, so far as I can tell, is not going anywhere ever, right? It's, it's distributed information. Uh, it's essentially infinitely durable in that way. And Bitcoin emulates that, right? It's uh, the entire history of transactions, the entire time chain is replicated everywhere. So to try and destroy Bitcoin uh, would require a, a Herculean effort that no one can even conceive of how to accomplish. So it makes, although Bitcoin is not tangible, it's just informational, it's actually perfected this property of durability as well. And I think these are the characteristics that make it better than gold. So um, you know, as we transition to a commodity-based system again, I, you know, people, I think the world comes to recognize that Bitcoin is a better version of gold because of these characteristics. One of them is that in, uh, it's immutable. And what that means is once a Bitcoin transaction is printed on the blockchain, it can't be changed. And so that's great for accounting and for audits. You know, the reason we have to do audits is that, you know, if, let's say Robert has a Bank of America account and I have a JP Morgan account and we move money back and forth to each other. You know, Bank of America and JP Morgan have to reconcile their ledgers together to clear that transaction. And then you need an auditor to come in and make sure no one's cheating. And Bitcoin fixes that problem. You know, it's one universal ledger. There's no reconciliation that needs to happen. You just move it from one side of the ledger to the other. And because it's immutable and it can never be changed, you don't need to audit it either. It's a permanent transaction and it's a central source of truth. And since this is a God, you know, thank God for Bitcoin conference, you know, there's other central sources of truth too that we're all aware of. So that's one, you know, one of the, aspects that I like about Bitcoin that's similar to God. Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's the greatest instantiation of truth human beings have ever created. So in that sense, it's maybe closer to the divine. It's, more, it's a closer reflection of the divine. And maybe that's why it's so tremendously valuable and useful. Um, but yeah, you know, humans, we need, like to your point, Banks have to reconcile these, their accounts, right, to get to the truth between one another, but there's always an inherent conflict that Bitcoin sort of 
does away with all the conflict, right? It's just automatically reconciling every 10 minutes. There's, there's nothing to argue about. It's an incontrovertible ledger. I mean, I guess you could argue with it, but it's just pointless. It's, it's, it is the truth. It is what it is, as they say. And uh, I think that's very important for, for human beings that are inherently antagonistic sometimes. Okay, we'll go on the next slide. So, did I, I must, did we already talk about this one? I think you no. mentioned everything, but okay, we'll, yeah. yeah. Um, let's go to the next one. All right. Um, a lot of people think that they've missed Bitcoin. Um, I started. I, I learned about it back in 2014, and I thought I missed it too. Um, a lot of my friends were buying it at like five to ten dollars, and I was buying it in like three hundred, four hundred dollars, and I thought I was really late. But if you look at Bitcoin relative to other Markets, it's Bitcoin's still very, very small. The entire cryptocurrency market is about one trillion dollars, and the Bitcoin market cap is, I think, today around you know right, hovering around five hundred billion. And so, it's still a very, very small market cap relative to the asset classes that I think it's going to replace. Yeah, that's we all we all feel late to Bitcoin. It's a weird thing, um, but it. The global store of value marketplace, somewhere between 100 and 300 trillion dollars, depending on what you put in that category, commodities, equities, real estate, uh, liquid bank accounts, M2, et cetera. So you're talking about a one, a 0 0.5 trillion dollar asset competing to become somewhere between 100 to 300 trillion dollars. Uh, of total addressable market. So it's a, what is that, a 200 to 600 X upside. So although Bitcoin is much more mature today, obviously, than it was when we got into it originally, it's still early days. Yeah, if you compare it to gold, gold's about a $12 trillion market cap. And if you look at the way you value gold and other commodities, you could use what's called a stock to flow ratio. And so for gold, if you take all the gold in the world and um, add that up, that's the stock of gold. If you divide it by the new gold that gets mined every year, that's the flow. And when you divide the stock divided by the flow, you get a ratio of 60 to 1. And gold's the rarest asset on earth today, a 60 to 1 ratio. Bitcoin's stock to flow ratio is 57 to 1 today. It's the second scarcest asset on earth. But Bitcoin only has a $500 billion market cap compared to 12 trillion of gold. But what happens in April or May of next year is the next Bitcoin halving. And so Bitcoin's flow gets cut in half in April or May of, of next year. And so Bitcoin's stock to flow ratio is going to go from 57 to 1 to 114 to 1. So Bitcoin becomes the scarcest asset on earth next year. And if gold has a $12 trillion market cap, and Bitcoin today is a $500 billion market value, you would think that Bitcoin's going to be worth more than gold if it's twice as scarce as gold. And so this is one of the you know, ways I get to where Bitcoin's going to be worth over a million dollars of Bitcoin in a few years, is using that stock-to-flow ratio. Yeah, the uh, other simplification maybe for that is that if it's just the inverse of the inflation rate. So the stock to flow ratio, if you do one over, if the inflation rate's 2%, right? One divided by 2% is 50. So it's how, it's a reflection of how rapidly you are being debased over a period of time. And as we said earlier, gold, we said gold was 60. So it's like somewhere like 1.2%, 1.5% um, annual inflation rate. That's how much purchasing power you're actually losing year over year. Bitcoin is unique, though, because it goes toward zero, right? There's 0% 0 unexpected inflation, although it's inflating slightly faster than gold today, to your point, after the halving next year, the stock-to-flow ratio doubles, which is to say the inflation rate gets cut in half. And, um, and that's something, again, very unique. We've never had that much information about a savings technology. We've just sort of picked the best tool for the job, and gold was that thing. Um, but in Bitcoin, we have something that is really the most suitable tool for the job. Okay, we can go on the next slide. So I, I find this interesting too, that um, people think that Bitcoin is something relatively new, 
but people have been trying to figure out how to create Bitcoin for a long time. So you may recognize some of these people up here. This is Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, and Luke Nosek. They started a company called PayPal back in 1998. And PayPal's original mission was to create the software to allow us to have currency that was independent from banks and governments. And they wanted to create Bitcoin, and they just couldn't. They, they couldn't figure out how to create Bitcoin. Um, I talked to Peter when he was at the um, Bitcoin conference last year, and I asked him, like, what, what was the sticking point? Why couldn't you create Bitcoin? And he said they couldn't solve the decentralization issue. And so he goes, we created the software, but as soon as we would launch it, the government would come in and shut us down because they were centralized. And they couldn't figure out how to decentralize the software. And that was the breakthrough that Satoshi Nakamoto made, is that he figured out how to decentralize the software so no one could shut it down. Yeah, and that's the operative word um, between Bitcoin and all other coins, is that Bitcoin is credibly, provably decentralized and that there have been attacks on it. It had resisted, the consensus rules have resisted change. Whereas every other altcoin, to use the nice word, um, <laughs> suffers from counterparty risk in the form of the developers or the foundation or some other controlling entity or party being able to change the rules. Uh, and that includes Ethereum, by the way. You could study the hard fork of 2016. So decentralization is the the very loaded term um, that I think people fail to understand when they come into the crypto world. And I think Bitcoin maximalists would say only Bitcoin is decentralized. Everything else is a dyno decentralized and name only. We good on time? Or... Okay. okay. All right. So we can go on the next slide. So uh, Milton Friedman um, back in 1999 talked about um, how the internet was missing something. It was missing like an e-cash system or a money system. And we had other versions of e-cash. We had e-gold and other software. But like we talked about, they were centralized systems, so the government would come in and shut them down. And so Milton Friedman, you know, before there was Bitcoin, you mentioned that you know, there's no way to transfer money through the internet peer-to-peer -peer from a person A to person B without those people knowing each other or without having a central you know, clearing mechanism to do that, like a bank or a Visa or a MasterCard. And we'll go to the next, next slide. Um, Mark Andreessen and I went to college together at University of Illinois. He was a couple years younger than me. When he graduated, he started a company called Netscape. He took the Mosaic software that um, he developed and started the first internet browser. Well, Mark tried to create Bitcoin back then too, uh, 30 years ago. He tried to create the peer-to-peer -peer software to transfer value through the internet. And, and Netscape and Mark couldn't figure that either. So what he developed was called a piece of software called SSL, which is the security layer on sitting on top of the internet. But Mark says today, you know, that you know Bitcoin's the most important technology since the internet itself. And because it was the it was the missing piece that you know we couldn't figure out. It's been missing now the internet for over 30 years. Yeah, in many ways, Bitcoin just is the internet, right? We have this, there's a stack of open source protocols uh, that we call the internet protocol suite. So these are things you've heard of like HTTP, TCP, IP, et cetera. And these protocols are useful for moving information or data packets around the world without permission. You don't need to ask IBM to set up a website, et cetera, et cetera. So that's proven to be an extremely disruptive and useful communication tool. And Bitcoin is just kind of like the latest layer on that stack. It's doing the same thing as the other, uh, the layers of the internet protocol suite, except we can move economic value without permission rather than just information. So uh, in many ways, it's, it's almost more important than the internet, although it's part of the internet, in that we needed to have uh, a means to move high signal messages or economic value that was decentralized and could not be um, you know, censored, shut down, interrupted, et cetera. And you know, thank God for Bitcoin, we finally got one. If you want to go on the next slide, this falls right into what Robert's talking about. You know, it's the missing piece of the internet puzzle. Um, you know, we have HTTP, which is hypertext transfer protocol, which is the internet. 
We have SMTP, which is email. Um, but what Bitcoin is kind of like, it, it's kind of like domain names. Um, if you think about it, if you've ever bought a domain name, you know, you're like, well, why do I have to buy a domain name? It's just, you know, it's internet. You know, it's just, why do I have to buy that? Well, it's scarce property on the internet. You know, there's only one Amazon.com, so it has value. And if you think about Bitcoin, it's the same thing. It's scarce property on the internet. There will only be 21 million Bitcoin, um, you know, in, in existence ever. Um, one of our mutual friends is Michael Saylor, who runs a company called MicroStrategy. He was very early into buying up domain names. He bought Michael.com, Mike.com, Hope.com, Voice.com. And he bought Voice.com 30 years ago for around $30. He sold it about a year and a half ago for $30 million. And, and ask yourself, well, why was it worth $30 30 years ago and it's worth $30 million today? And the reason is that when he bought it, there were only a few million people using the internet. And today there's billions of people using the internet. The network value is more because more people are using it. And you could equate Bitcoin to the same thing. There's only a few hundred million people using Bitcoin today. But in the future, when there's many billion people using it, it's going to be worth more because it's a scarce asset on the internet, scarce property. Basically, digital, what we say, native currency for the internet. So any, all the commerce that's being conducted online, at some point, we'd expect that to be flowing through Bitcoin. Okay, we can go on the next slide. So, yeah, well, this is what we were just talking about. So, sorry about that. You want to go to the next slide after that? Um, so, if you look at Bitcoin as a payment network, you know, this is how it measures up against the other payment networks. So, Visa and MasterCard, um, they're 50 to 60 year old legacy networks. And, you know, they're growing about, you know, 2% a year. Bitcoin's growing much faster than Visa and MasterCard are. It already passed uh, Discover and American Express in payment volume, um, but it's projected out that in a few years, Bitcoin will be larger than Visa and MasterCard. And one of the important things to point out is, um, you know, if you look at credit card transactions, they average around $50 per transaction, and the average Bitcoin transaction is over $50,000. And that's been growing and growing. I remember when I first got involved with Bitcoin, the average transaction size was less than $1,000. And so, you know, it's my opinion that as this becomes the primary monetary layer of the world, that the that, that average transaction side will, will be in the millions, um, you know, in, in the future. Yeah, especially as we move into layer two technologies like Lightning, that you can settle a lot more of the day-to-day -day transactions on a layer two and only occasionally have to settle to main chain. I would expect that pattern to continue, that we'd get larger and larger average transaction sizes on the Bitcoin main chain. Um, the other thing that's important to note here is these payment channels are not comparable exactly. Uh, for instance, when there was the Freedom truck convoy in Canada, uh, there was a GoFundMe right, that was done for 10 million some odd dollars that was then censored. They, they froze the funds, they froze the contributors' bank accounts, they froze the protester bank accounts. And a lot of that money, I think the money ended up getting returned, but it was frozen. That in that that payments channel, when it went against state policy, that payments channel was basically shut down with the press of a button. But the Bitcoin that was contributed to the truckers did get through, right? It's an unstoppable payments channel. And I think that's it's qualitatively and fundamentally different than Visa, MasterCard, et cetera. Um, again, in support of, of human freedom and human choice. Yeah, just to build on that too, um, Julian Assange at WikiLeaks, um, when they shut down his bank accounts back, I think it was like 2012, 2013, he started accepting Bitcoin. And so there were a lot of people that sent him Bitcoin, and he has millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin now because of that, because it grew up, it grew, it grew in value. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So this is the Bitcoin economics. Um, so like we talked about, there's a maximum of 21 million Bitcoin that can ever be created. It gets created at a predetermined rate. Today it's about 900 Bitcoin a day, which is six and a quarter Bitcoin every 10 minutes. And that supply, that, that reward that gets uh, issued out to the people who mine Bitcoin 
or clear the transactions through the network, that reward gets cut in half approximately every four years. It's exactly every 210,000 blocks. So if you take 210,000 blocks times 10 minutes, that comes out to about four years. So approximately every four years, that reward gets cut in half. And as the reward keeps getting cut in half from 900 Bitcoin a day to 450 Bitcoin a day to 225 Bitcoin a day, then the scarcity increases. And so if you have a fixed supply of an asset and you have increased demand like we have, the, if you look at the number of Bitcoin wallets, it's been growing at over 500% per year. And so if you have increased demand and limited supply, the only other thing that could change is the price. And that's why Bitcoin's been the best performing asset class um, 11 out of the past 14 years is because of the supply, dyna supply demand dynamic. Uh, yes, and I think that may, to try and maybe say it in a simple way is if when miners are committing capital expenditure, so equipment and electricity to securing the Bitcoin network, they're basically competing to receive this newly issued Bitcoin every 10 minutes. And that Bitcoin per block is cut in half every four years. That is the halving. So the miners that are winning this new Bitcoin are typically selling most of it to pay their bills, right? They might be keeping a little bit of it, uh, some of their profit margin. But what we're saying with the halving is you're effectively reducing the selling pressure from miners by 50%. So if, this, if the selling pressure goes down 50%, even if demand is constant, right, much less increasing as you're describing, that is the number go up technology, as Bitcoiners call it. Um, and that's how Bitcoin, that is what Bitcoin is programmed to do from now until the year 2140 when it stops issuing new Bitcoin entirely. So uh, it might sound overly simplistic or even too good to be true, but no one's figured out how to stop this dynamic, that it just keeps becoming more scarce and therefore more precious, and it goes through these massive price cycles as a result. Yeah, and um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up with this. And um, I, I'm always pro-education, and if you're new to Bitcoin, um, you know, I was new to it nine years ago, but you, you know, I just encourage you to learn more about it. Um, Michael Saylor, um, like I said, owns the website hope.com. If you go to hope.com, it's a great resource for Bitcoin education. And so I, I just want to encourage everybody out here just to continue to ed educate yourself about what this new technology is all about. Yeah, there was recently a, uh, I, I don't know if they're a protester or what, but they were using a laser light, beaming it onto the European Central Bank building, and it just had a huge Bitcoin emblem, and it said, study Bitcoin. And I love that, because it's not, I, we're not here to like tell you to buy Bitcoin. I try to not be prescriptive on the show, although, of course, I'm an advocate for Bitcoin, but I'm not telling people to buy it. It's more about asking the question, right? Like, what is money, or just studying Bitcoin in general? And I, I think it's... It's just a great way to expand your horizons. So I would encourage everyone here to do it and encourage people to encourage, encourage others to do it as well. And thank you for having us today. Thank you. Thank you.